Thanks, Hannah. Um, would you all stand for the reading of the scripture? <clears throat> this is from Mark 14, verses 53 through 65. And they led Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. Then Peter had followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he was sitting with the guards and warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet even about this testimony they did not agree. Then the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. Again the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, What further witnesses do we need? You have heard this, his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to strike him, saying to him, Prophesy. And the guards received him with blows. This is the word of God. You may be seated. Well, I think, um, I think most, most people, um, imagine most people in our congregation, I can always say that, are especially kind of dialed in right now, tuned in to sort of the unique horror of miscarried justice, uh, which is just another word for injustice. Um, I think about the killing of, of Tyree Nichols uh, just a few weeks ago. Um, and we're, we're horrified by these things because, you know, it's, it's almost a cliche, but the, the, it's, it's just, it's true that no person or group of people should get to function as judge, jury, and executioner. Uh, America's you know, legal system has all kinds of problems, but when it works well, as it's intended to, it is one of the best in the world, as I understand it. Um, and when it's shortcut, when it's influenced, when it's bypassed, when it's hindered, when, it's, when bias is allowed to in, come in for a number of reasons, and all the various ways it can be perverted, uh, we are right to look at it with horror and, and to say, this isn't right. This, it's meant to prick us at a deep level when we see that happen. Um, this is the, the plot of some of our best films. This is uh, the story of some of our most profound and challenging novels. What happens whenever justice is not done? When, uh, or you could even put it this way, God's kingdom does not come in these ways. His will is not done in these matters. The story that Ben just read for us is a story of Jesus entering into that exact scenario. Um, not in every detail, not, you know, every story is unique, every instance uh, has its own details and, and structures and reasons, but this is the story of Jesus' trial. This is the trial of Jesus that we just read about, um, at least part of it. Uh, we'll just jump right in. Uh, verse 53 says, they led Jesus to the high priest, all the chief priests and elders and the scribes came together, and Peter well, we're going we're gonna to pick up Peter next week, so we're going to kind of let this slide now. But Peter had followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he was sitting with the guards and warming himself by the fire. So we get the scene set here. What, what we have is, if you remember last week, Michelle taught us about uh, Jesus' arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was finally captured. Uh, Peter tries to use his sword to, to basically start a, start a war here over it. Jesus rebukes him. Jesus allows himself to be, to be captured uh, because it was the will of his father to do so. Um, and now we see that they're, they're shuttling Jesus. This group of folks are shuttling Jesus to here, the house the private house of, of the chief priest. And you should, you know, you might not know a lot about the legal, you know, environment at this time, but I assure you, it's never a good thing for someone to be taken to someone's private house in the middle of the night if you want justice to be done, ever. 
It's not how it works. It wasn't how it worked then. It's not how it worked now. In fact, uh, shortly after the time of this story, it became explicitly illegal in the rabbinic teachings to ever convene any sort of legal operation at nighttime for obvious reason. In the dark, you can get away with a lot. But where do they go? So they go to the chief priest's house. And Peter's following. He goes into the courtyard. And what we see is that much of the religious establishment is there. And throughout the Gospel of Mark, Jesus has just been in this like slow simmering conflict with all of these people. This mentions the chief priests, the elders, the scribes. These are the same people who have been challenging Jesus. Uh, They've been plotting to kill him now since the early chapters of the book. And here's their moment. They've got him. Jesus is in cuffs. Jesus is not going anywhere. He's under, he's in their jurisdiction. Um, in the Jewish Sanhedrin, you've probably heard that word before, Sanhedrin. It's just, it basically uh, is the highest court in ancient Jerusalem. It's made up of 71 men from each of these categories, chief priests, elders, scribes. And so they would meet together with a quorum at the temple. But that's not what this is. Again, this is a secret meeting in the cover of darkness. Uh, and therefore it's illegal, and therefore it's wrong, and we immediately see that something is not right. This, this meeting is happening to pervert justice quite intentionally. So that's the scene that's being set for us. And it gets worse. As we read on in verse 55, it says, the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. So they're asking people, hey, what do you got? We hate this guy, right? Surely we hate him for good reason. Let's, let's hear all the illegal things and wrong things and unrighteous things and blasphemous things he's been doing. And it just, there was nothing. They were like, we do hate this guy. It's hard to remember why, though. <laughs> you ever been in that position? I know I'm supposed to hate this person. And why was that again? Um, that's the position they're in. Many bore false witness against Jesus but their testimonies did not agree. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. Some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, we heard him say, quote, I will destroy this temple that's made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet even about this, tes- this their testimony did not agree. So the, f- the first layer of tragedy here, we've said it before, I just want to say it again right here, is this. This group... These, these experts in the Jewish law, in the, he- the law of the Hebrew Bible, religious law, the ones who are meant to be sort of the mediators and uh, go-betweens between the God of the universe and his people, Israel, they are the ones who should recognize when the God of the universe is standing incarnate before them face-to-face when he's teaching, when he's performing miracles, when he's caring for the poor, when he's doing all of the things that encapsulate the heart of of the God that is all over the pages of this Bible that they are experts in. They should be the ones to go, that's him. Oh my gosh, that is him. He is here. And they don't. They don't. The Son of God is taken before his supposed leaders, his supposed lovers, his supposed representatives, his supposed mediators, and they have nothing but scorn for him. Nothing but hatred for him. There was just a thick, like, cosmic tragedy to this moment. The ones who should, see, who should be most prepared to see him and to fall down and worship him cannot and do not. But also notice the way in which what they do here is to twist or misunderstand Jesus' words. What, some of the people stood up and said, basically, Jesus said he's going to destroy the temple. But we have no evidence in the Gospels that Jesus ever said that. He said something similar to that. In John 2, uh, one of the other four Gospels, John, uh, it says, the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? And Jesus answered, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And the Jews then said, it's taken 46 years to build this temple. You'll raise it up in three days. But John tells us he was speaking about the (laughs) the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. So so notice the exact phrasing of what Jesus said. He said, if you destroy this temple, I will raise it up. He didn't say he was going to destroy the temple, and furthermore, he's speaking metaphorically about his own body that is 
in some ways replacing the temple. Here he is, the presence of God amongst humanity in an even more profound way than the temple could be. So notice, notice how subtly they're twisting the words of Jesus to, to ratchet up this claim against him, to have a, a way to condemn him. This is, a, this, this is a, a note to all of us to be very, very careful with the words of God. It is very, very easy to not give them the dignity that they're owed, to read something, oh, I know what that means, I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm good with that, and to just take it off in a direction that was never intended. You might find yourself condemning God himself when you do that. That's the, that's the, the lesson, one of the lessons of this passage. We need to humbly come under to seek to understand what he has left for us as students and as worshipers carefully and considerately. Another really sad and tragic thing about this, this story is, is that what they end up doing to condemn the Son of God is violating, all the, is violating the commands of God. You know, they, they don't really have anything to condemn him with. Jesus had lived utterly above reproach, as we would expect. He's the sinless Son of God. So they have to formulate these false testimonies against him. And you know what they're doing in that process? Gosh, think of the Ten Commandments, friends. Exodus 20, 16. You know what that one says? You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Deuteronomy 19 says that false witness is a, in a capital case, if you're caught giving false witness, you are to be put to death. Now, that's intense. That's intense. And we're no longer under that law today here in the U.S. But that is, the, the point of that is that Charging someone with a crime falsely for a capital offense, something that will have them executed, if you're lying about that, we have zero toleration for that. The consequence is so extreme to be a deterrent that you, you just do not trifle with the legal proceedings here. And this is exactly what they're doing. They have God in their midst, the Son of God, Jesus Christ in flesh, and they are breaking the Ten Commandments, and they are making themselves liable to death with these false accusations. In working so hard to condemn the Son of God, they have condemned themselves. It's tragic. It's tragic. So in this, we begin to see a beautiful little glimpse of the meaning of the cross right here. In this, we begin to see that we have the perfect Jesus, the sinless Jesus, the one for whom they cannot even raise a legitimate condemnation against, who is coming in to be judged. He is coming to take on this false, this evil, this wrong, this corrupt judgment against himself. Jesus is condemned by sinful man when we know as, if, as we keep reading the story, so that sinful man can be redeemed by this perfect Jesus. Here we see him taking our judgment to give us his judgment. This, is, this scene is deeply important for understanding the meaning of the cross that's, that's to follow. So that's the false witness. But there's a true witness given in this story. There's a true witness given in this story. So the, the moment kind of reaches this crescendo in verse 60 when it says, the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? Verse 61, but he, that's Jesus, remained silent and made no answer. Like the silent suffering servant in Isaiah. He remains silent. He's not dignifying these things with a response. And that's been kind of the MO of Jesus throughout the, throughout the gospel, right? As, as people have come to Jesus, especially, specifically the religious leaders, and they want to trap him and challenge him, he's not making, he's not telling them who he is. He's not engaging with them directly a whole lot of times. He's answering them in enigmatic idi ways that kind of turn the question back on them. And this is kind of in keeping with that until, until, again, the high priest asked him, are you the Christ? the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed. 
And that title, Son of the Blessed, it's a circumlocution for Son of God. You know, if, if you know much about uh, Jews, they, they do not want to say the names of God like, directly, so they find ways to kind of uh, create euphemisms and workarounds. So Son of Blessed is a dignified way to refer to the Son of God. He's asking him, are you the Son of God? Be with Jesus. What do you say? So here it is, the question of questions. Is this Jesus the Messiah and the Son of God? Now Jesus is ready to answer. Once, once and for all. This is like the only time that he just gives them the straight up answer throughout this entire gospel. It's in this moment when he's being judged, he turns it on and he declares, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. The high priest finally comes to the point, are you the Christ or not? Are you the Son of God or not? And Jesus finally answers directly. And look at what all he's claiming in this passage. You know, a lot of people try to make the argument that, you know, Jesus never claimed to be like this big guy. He was just kind of a humble teacher or whatever. I mean, this text totally undercuts that idea. He says, yes, I am. I am the Christ. I am the Messiah, which is Israel's God-anointed deliverer, the true king who's coming to put all things right. That's me. And yes, I am the son of the blessed, the son of God. That's such a scandalous title because it means to be the son of God is to be virtually equal with God, to be of the same nature of God. He says, yes, that's me too. Not just the Messiah, I'm also the son of God, yes. Even in his phrasing, the Greek, ego, I, me, I am. Most of you probably hear that and your, your, your bells are ringing a little bit. Like, oh, that's, that's one way to refer in Greek to the name of God, Yahweh. Like that, there's probably loaded significance there in him choosing to answer with that phrase, I am. Reminds you of in John, before Abraham was, I am. God's covenant name. And then he also identifies himself again. He does this lots of times. It's his favorite title for himself as the son of man. That comes from this passage in Daniel chapter 7, the Old Testament prophet, this one who was at the right hand of power, the right hand of God, who would rule on behalf of God. He's like this figure of like cosmic justice. And Jesus says, yes, I'm that too. So he takes all these images and he weaves them together. He says, I'm all of it. I'm all of it. Yes, I am. So now they have a decision to make. Now they have a decision to make. Here's what they do. Verse 63. The high priest tore his garments. Classic sign of just absolute grief and indignity. He tore his garments and he said, What further witnesses do we need? You've heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? What is your decision? See, it it was not illegal. It was not blasphemy for Jesus to claim to be the Christ. We need to grasp this. Lots of people claimed to be the Messiah. There were messianic figures who said, yep, I'm him. I'm going to do it. Tried to lead rebellions. They were ultimately killed. Um, And they were never charged with blasphemy. There were going to be messianic figures who claimed to be Messiah after Jesus as well. That wasn't really the scandal here. It was probably annoying to them and dangerous to them. And if he's wrong, that's a big deal, whatever. But you you wouldn't get charged with blasphemy for that. They understood in Jesus' response, he is saying, I'm divine. I am your God. And the high priest rightly tears his garments I say rightly because if Jesus is wrong about what he's saying, there is no response that could be tolerated other than killing him. He says, you've heard this blasphemy. What is your decision? And all of them, all of these wise teachers, all of these wise leaders, all of these experts in the Hebrew Bible, they condemned him as deserving death. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to strike him, saying to him, prophesy. And the guards received him with blows. So their response is, 
you have claimed to be the Son of God, so you're a blasphemer, the most serious crime we have. They condemn him to execution, which would, in their legal arrangement, would require Roman approval, so that's why we're going to get here, here soon the story of Jesus being sent to Pontius Pilate. He's going to have to sign off on this execution. We'll read about that later. But they have decided for their part, we want this guy dead. They respond to Jesus with violence. They hit him. They cover his face and, and hit him some more. And then it's the mockery mingled in there as well. The spitting, the, the, the mockery of Jesus as a prophet. Cover his head, hit him. Who hit you, you great prophet? Tell us. They're, they're out to humiliate Jesus. Their hatred is just boiling over in this moment. And the main point I want to just kind of conclude on here is this. What Jesus has just done in this story, it's, it, it's not surprising to us who've been reading along in the gospel according to Mark. I mean, we've seen him claim these radical things before. We've seen him on the Mount of Transfiguration showing himself to be the divine son of God. Uh, we've, we expect him to be betrayed and arrested and ultimately killed. We know all these things. Uh, but this moment creates for us uh, what I think what C.S. Lewis, we've, we've mentioned this before, pointed out, and I, don't even, I didn't even bother to look up the reference uh, this time, so I forget which book it's in, but the, the trilemma. Jesus, in making these kinds of claims, leaves you with three options. Jesus is either a liar. He says, I'm the son of God. I'm the Messiah. I'm the son of man. I'm all these things rolled up together in ways you're not even going to be able to understand. 2,000 years later, people in Portland, Oregon are still going to be chewing on this and wrestling on this and writing books about this and trying to understand how this all works together. Suffice it to say, trust me, I'm God. Jesus was either, with respect to that claim, a liar. Like, he knew he wasn't these things, but he thought, you know, maybe I'll, you know, it's good. It's good to be God. If you get a bunch of enough followers, you know, you amass some power for yourself. You can do some, some fun things. You can make life pretty sweet for yourself. Whatever Jesus' agenda was he, was, he was lying about this identity. That's one option. The second option is that he's a lunatic. It's that he was mistaken about this. And then I, I just remember the quote. It's like Jesus, Lewis says something like, we would have to dismiss Jesus as uh, no more sophisticated than, someone who, than some man who thinks he's a poached egg. You know, I love that. But that's the case of it. Jesus is not leaving us, you know, with another option as to say he's, he's willfully deceiving us or this man is deluded out of his mind to say that, yes, I am the eternal God of the universe. Before Abraham was, I am. Yes, I'm the son of man talked about in Daniel. Yes, I am the son of the blessed. He's a psychopath if he's wrong about this. Or the third option is that he's the Lord, is that he's true, he's right. These claims that he's making are sincere. What he's saying accurately captures one of the most fundamental and important truths in the entire universe. C.S. Lewis's trilemma is to get us out of this sort of halfway point where, where, where we look at Jesus and say, yes, he was an interesting moral teacher. Lewis's precise point is that he has not left us that option. You might like his moral teaching and not believe he's God, but then you should be very skeptical about that moral teaching if it's all wrapped up in this idea that he's God. How could you trust somebody like that? You have to reject it all. You have to reject it all or you have to receive it all. What this story does is it highlights that, yes, it, it, and it, it puts, a, puts a fine point on this idea that Jesus is a threat to every other totalitizing system out there. Like, you, you read about this, you, you read this story, and for, for some of us in this room, you might read this and you're like, okay, I know we've been going through the gospel according to Mark, and I know, okay, yes, Jesus is making these extreme claims, but like, why do they hate him so much? He's pretty cool. Like, overall, he's pretty chill. He's feeding people that are hungry. He's healing people, you know. He's trying to call people to greater standards of holiness or righteousness or whatever. Uh, he's pretty gracious. He's pretty nice, you know. 
you, you read about this stuff, and on one hand, it's easy to get lured back into that. Oh, I mean, like, what's the big deal? Why do they hate him so much? Why do they hate him so much? And it's precisely his claim in this passage, again. He hasn't left us the option to just go, yeah, he's a cool guy who does nice things that I like and agree with. Because he says, yes, you may, you, you may like and agree with those things, but they're meaningless apart from the central claim that I'm making, which is that I am him. I'm God. And if he's right, if he's right, it means every other power, every other voice out there that would seek to claim your allegiance, that would seek to claim your energy, that would seek to claim the meaning of your life or whatever else, is either going to have to subjugate itself to him, it's going to have to crown him, say, I will submit my desires to yours, Jesus, because I think you are the, the one final true king. Or they're going to have to kill him. They're going to have to kill him to try to stamp out his authority. Those are the two options <laughs> Jesus has left them with. There isn't some other halfway middle ground. You can crown him or you can kill him. If Jesus is who he says he is in this passage, then we must fall down, we must worship, we must obey. If Jesus is king, Caesar is not. If Jesus is king, the temple authorities are not. If Jesus is king, you can insert anything in that blank. They are not. Even more so, if Jesus is king, you are not. I am not. There is no other but him. If Jesus is the Son of God, he has the right to define right and wrong, good and evil, just and unjust. His identity, what he's claiming about himself, is a challenge for all of us to submit ours to him, ultimately. And I think there's something in this, there's something in this that sort of explains why the name of Jesus is just such a scandal. Um, and the name of Jesus can be a scandal for, for a whole host of other reasons. It, there's no shortage of, of Christians uh, dragging the name of Jesus through the mud. There's no shortage of stories of, of, of Christians, probably me, I've probably done this for, for numerous people in my own life, tragically, sadly. Um, but there's no shortage of Christians who have made it legitimately difficult for people to see the real Jesus and to choose to follow him. We all know that. We know those stories. Probably some of you have been affected by those things, and that's part of why you're still wrestling with your own discipleship to Jesus. So we can acknowledge that, of course. But, but, on the other hand, there's something so fascinating about how you, you know, you sat, saddle up at the bar and people are talking about, oh yeah, I'm getting into uh, meditation. I'm getting into Buddhism. Yeah, I'm kind of exploring uh, Shintoism or Hinduism or witchcraft or the occult and some other things. I'm really, I'm really getting into sort of psychonautics and like hardcore <laughs> like psychedelic drugs and all this crazy stuff. It's just becoming more and more commonplace. And you're, you're there, you're in the company of you know, nice Portlanders, and everyone kind of nods along. Oh, that's cool, man. Oh, that's interesting. Wow, tell me more about that. That's oh, yeah. Oh, cool, wow. And then someone says the name Jesus. <sighs> the air goes out of the room, man. You felt it. Maybe you've been that person that sucked the air out of the room. The question turns to you, what about you? What do you believe about the deep things of life? Man, I believe Jesus is king. Whoa. It does not hit the same way as any of these other things, and we do well to ask why. We do well to ask why. And it's not, I don't think fundamentally it's because of his moral teachings, although there are plenty that deeply cut against the grain of our, our culture, but our culture is going to continue to change and evolve, and different things will come in and out of fashion. I think it's this very claim. It's this very claim that I am the Son of of God. I am the Messiah. I am the Son of Man. It's the claim that Jesus makes when he commissions his disciples. All authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples. 
Jesus makes a unique claim that instantly puts us all in this position, the same position that Jesus asked his disciples on the road up to the Mount of Transfiguration. Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? He's telling us who he says he is. And we can either receive it or we can reject it. But he's not leaving us another choice here. He's not leaving us another choice here. Sorry about that, Mike. So the question I think that this text puts to all of us today is that very same one. Who do you say that he is? Who do you say that he is today? Maybe you answered that question 10 years ago for the first time, 30 years ago. But who do you say today? Who is he? Who is he? And what does that mean for your life? I think today we do well to ask the ways in which maybe we've gotten lazy in answering that question. Maybe we've begun to presume our answer. Well, my, you know, I'm part of a community that says Jesus is king. My parents say Jesus is king. My friends do, whatever, whatever else. But who do you say he is in your heart of hearts right now? And what does that mean for you? crazy thing about Christianity and the crazy thing about the claim of Jesus and the crazy thing that it makes it so interesting why, you know, in this very conversation, how we're talking about the name of Jesus sort of sucking the air out of the room and it becoming like, oh, you can't say that. You can't talk about him is the idea that if you keep reading, if you keep listening, if you keep discerning what this Jesus is about, yes, he claims to be the one who is all-powerful, all-authoritative. He claims that no one comes to the Father but through him. All those things are true. All those things are scandalous in our day. But he's also the only one of any of these religious systems. I truly believe this is one of the things that makes Christianity so unique amongst world religions, who says, and you know what? I'm not asking you to do anything except receive what I'm going to do for you. That's the meaning of this scene. He is entering into our judgment that we deserve. He's allowing himself to be falsely condemned so that we can be declared righteous. He is willfully being arrested. He's going to be, he's going to be flogged. He's going to be humiliated. He's going to be killed, publicly executed for you and for me. To speak of Jesus is not to speak of, you know, this like all-powerful autocrat fundamentally. It's to speak of the one who came to lay down his life for his friends and for his enemies. It's to speak of the one who came to do everything necessary to reconcile people to God. It's beautiful, friends. There is no one else like it. So today, today, we're going to worship and do the things we normally do, but I want that question, who do you say that I am to weigh heavy on your mind? And as you answer it, if you can today answer that in agreement with what Jesus is claiming in this passage, I pray that you would just pray for a fresh fervor in responding to that truth. That we have a moment here to encounter him. We have promised that his presence is here in our midst, that we can declare back to him the worship and the honor and the love that he is due without reservation. Amen? Let's do that. Pray with me.